Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, and marchers, and activists, and foodies, and eaters of all shapes and sizes, thank you very much for coming tonight. And voters, especially voters, thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> So for those of you who weren't aware, and many of you maybe, we had a fabulous day on campus this day. We held our third Stanford Food Summit, which some of you came to. Thank you very much. It was a fabulous uh, set of presentations of some academic community partners. We had hospital food, food bank food, school food, food policy. A lot of networking went on. We talked about the students on campus are asking for a food systems minor. Um, the undergraduate group is asking us to generate something novel. It's called a food helix, which I don't have time to explain to you, but it's a very exciting night. And this is the capstone of the whole night. We are so fortunate to have John Robbins here to talk to you tonight. How many of you have Diet for a New America? Come on, raise your hands high. Okay, I don't, did you bring your dog-eared books to have him sign them after it? I would be surprised if somebody... Did you not think of that? Ah! Oh! You should have thought of that. Well, I'm not sure if he was going to sign books anyway, so I shouldn't have promised anything. After John speaks for about 45 minutes, we have an expert panel that's sitting right here that's going to talk about the Farm Bill, and some of them knew you were coming with your Prop 37 sign, so they will be prepared to talk about Prop 37. All right? Last year, we did something similar with Francis Moore Le Pay, and we had... Um, audience microphones and it didn't work very well so this year what we're going to do is we're going to hand out index cards up and down you'll have a whole hour and a half to fill them out and if you have a question that you would like to ask we will come periodically up and down the aisles to collect your questions so you will have to help us hand them to the center of the aisle and hand them back once they're filled out so we would appreciate your co cooperation in that regard all right, so that'll be the format. John will talk for 45. Our experts will talk for an hour or so, and then there'll be 15 minutes or 30, depending on how long they talk, for your questions, and they will try to address your questions. So if that doesn't raise any questions, without further ado, it is my tremendous honor to introduce John Robbins, the winner of the Rachel Carson Award, the winner of the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award, the author of 10 books, um, the one perhaps most known to many of you is The Diet for a New America. He also wrote Food Revolution, and the title of his talk tonight is Food Revolution. I thought I would share with you that when I went to pick up the posters for John, and we made many posters, the woman was waiting me for, to show to, for me to show up and pick them up, and she said, that's the guy, that's the guy that changed my diet 25 years ago. So that was really fun to walk up, the, get the posters and hear that. So, this, this man is a giant in the food movement. He's extremely active. He's written a stunning piece on Prop 37 that just went viral yesterday. So, he has a lot of great things to tell you tonight. Please give a warm welcome to John Robbins. Buzz. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher, wherever you went. There he is. Thank you. And thank you all for, for being here, for bringing your attention, your energy, your presence to this revolution. Revolution is a loaded word. The revolution I'm interested in is one that's guided by love, that, that brings us into alignment with our compassion, with our wisdom, with our, our higher possibilities to live with integrity and with respect for ourselves and each other and the living web that gives us life. And that alignment isn't easy, particularly in a culture as astray as ours, as out of balance as ours has become. The effort that it takes, the intention with which we need to live in order that our lives become statements of our aspirations and statements of our caring uh, is considerable. 
it really isn't easy. And, and if, if you thought it was going to be or need it to be in order to, to pr- proceed, you won't make it. You won't pers- persevere. The tenacity that we have to find in order that our commitments be manifest is why we're here, that we find in this gathering, in our own experience of ourselves, a renewal of our commitment, our conviction, our courage, even in the face of what we see around us that's deteriorating, that's collapsing, that's breaking. It's breaking down, it's breaking our hearts. There's so much awry. And then we try to find entry points into this where we can do a maximum amount of healing, a maximum amount of good, create a maximum amount of progress with the minimum amount of energy that we have and attention that we have. And and I, I look for those entry points, those points of intervention, those acupuncture points where with the minimum amount of effort we get a maximum amount of healing to the whole system hopefully to the whole planet, but certainly to our whole lives. And I want to talk to you about a few of those tonight. And one of them is right in my face because I'm seeing a lot of yes on 37 right to no uh, banners, including coastal farmers from Pacifica to Pescadero want labels, my family is not a special interest. <laughs> do, do, do you, who, who knows what Prop 37 is? Good, thank you. Well, that was most of you. That was, I'm glad. Uh, it's really important. It, it's, it's an, it is a pivotal, pivotal moment. Uh, Michael Pollan, writing a couple days ago, said, uh, it, on, on how 37 goes, we'll learn whether there is a food movement in this country. Uh, another food activist, Stacey Malkin, added, on how 37 goes, we'll find out whether there's any democracy left in this country. And I think they have good points, because if Monsanto has its way with us, there's no food movement. And if we don't have the knowledge, there is no democracy without an informed citizenry. And what's at stake here is our right to know. What, are, are we allowed to know, in this case, whether foods are genetically engineered or not. You know, all of the ads that the the No on 32 people are putting out, and they're spending over a million dollars a day now, blanketing the the airwaves, um, TV ads, um, mailers that arrive in your mailbox uninvited. Um, None of their ads, they they call it the, 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 the the deceptive labeling scheme. None of their ads mention the words genetically engineered or genetically modified. They don't mention that that's what we're actually wanting to have labeled. And their, their ads are full of lies. And um, this poster over here, my family's not a special interest. They're claiming that special interests are behind this bill. And, and, and uh, I think about that sometimes. Um, because the actual people who are behind it, I know them. <laughs> and I think of them as very special people. <laughs> um, but special interests, Monsanto, DuPont, Syngentia, the Biotech Industry Organization, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, those are the leading donors to the No on 37 campaign. They are pouring in tens of millions of dollars into this state to try to control how you vote about it, to try to keep you eating in the dark. Compared to that, the people who are working on this campaign, the million people who signed the petition to get it on the ballot, who's the special, which is the real special interest here? And, and I, they've been able to control to the agrochemical industry Big Ag in general, has been able to control the Farm Bill, has been able to control 
the USDA, the EPA, to, to an extent that is really discrepant with the general welfare and the public interest in the future of our food systems being sustainable. And they're, it's inconsistent with human rights. It's inconsistent with the health of our children. But it is quite consistent with their pocketbooks and, and their immediate rewards. And this is the tension that's going on. And something is really at stake in this election. I, I think still 37 is going to pass. Yes. Yes. And, and there's a lot of people that want to see it, and Monsanto doesn't. And they're, they're working real hard. But who is Monsanto, anyway, to tell us what we should know and not? You know, they, they claimed DDT was safe all the time. They claimed Agent Orange was safe. Now they tell us genetically engineered foods are safe. Um, when the first significant major food to enter the food supply that was GMO was bovine growth hormone. Monsanto genetically engineered a hormone, a synthetic hormone, which was sold to large dairies, injected into dairy cows, with the result that these cows gave more milk. Their udders got bigger got much bigger, became distended, in some cases actually dragged on the ground. They be it became physically impossible for their calves to nurse if they were allowed to try, which they aren't in, in large dairies. Um, and also produced regularly, predictably, and reliably a, a, a condition called mastitis, an utter infection. And, and it was so consistent that when Monsanto would deliver the bovine growth hormone to the dairies, in the same package would come the antibiotics that would be needed to treat the mastitis that would inevitably occur as a result of using the hormone. It became widely used in the middle and late 90s in large dairies in this country. Um, it's illegal in every other country in the world. Um, there began to be some small dairies, particularly in Vermont and Connecticut, but then they spread, Texas, uh, California, that objected to this treatment of their cows. The cows were under tremendous stress. They got sick in all kinds of ways. They showed, anyone who was paying attention to the, to the animals could tell they, they were really uh, suffering. Um, yes, they gave more milk, but they were sick and they were showing many signs uh, of, of illness and distress. And so some small dairies said, well, we don't want to do this to our cows. We don't want to subject our, our customers to this experiment. So we're not going to use it. And then they put accurately on their labels of their yogurt or their cheese or their ice cream, whatever, their milk made without GMOs, um, made without RBGH, made without RBST, bovine similar trophin, different names for the same product. And what happened then, and, and, and the reason I'm telling you this, is because Monsanto sued these dairies who were accurately stating to the public that they did not use Monsanto's product. Now, what grounds do you think Monsanto used for their suits? They sued them on the grounds that by, admittedly accurately, informing the public they weren't using the product, they were unfairly stigmatizing Monsanto's product, implying there must be something wrong with it. And although that might strike you as a twisted kind of logic or perverse kind of argument, Monsanto's financial clout is so great that they were, no dairy could, uh, the small dairy could stand up to them. And so the legal battle would take place, and then dairy would be forced with, if we continue to pay the legal fees, we'll go out of business. Some did and folded. Others just simply took the label off in order to survive. This happened again and again and again. Finally, so many dairies were doing that Monsanto stopped suing, and now you'll see those labels on the product. They tried, though, they tried very hard and for many years succeeded in preventing people from knowing which dairy products didn't use their product. There is this war on awareness going on. Another place I see it is in what are called ag-gag bills. Have you heard that phrase? The animal factory industry, the, 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 the people that, that do big livestock operations, 
uh, factory farms, feedlots, um, have been taking a, a PR beating because people go in with hidden cameras and get footage of what's actually done to the animals. And the cruelty gets exposed, and they get embarrassed, and sometimes they get fined, sometimes it's a slap on the wrist, but it, they don't like it. So they're passing these bills, called ag-gag bills, that make it a felony to get employment in an animal industry if you have previously worked for an animal protection group, animal rights group, and haven't disclosed that to them. If you have, and, and to take footage and, and reveal it to the public is a felony. So they're trying to keep you from knowing what's going on. They don't want you to see it. They want to keep the veil in place. They want to keep you ignorant. The yes on 37 people, I mean the no on 37 people want to keep you ignorant about which foods are GMO. And there is a saying, I'm sure you've heard of it, that ignorance is bliss. That may be true in some cases. It is not true here. In this instance, ignorance is subservience. It's subordination to Monsanto's agenda, to the factory farm agenda, to the control of our food supply, to the control of our food awareness. I've often thought, what do you see when you look in the mirror of your food world? If you think of your food choices and food experiences as a mirror, and you look into that mirror, what do you see? Do you see self-respect and self-care and, and, and intentionality and, and a commitment to your health and well-being and a connection to the, to the greater world and, and, and the, the living earth community? Do you see the, the rain and the water that irrigates the crops? Do you see the human labor there with, re with respect for the people who worked in the fields, planted the crops, d d dug the wells, drove the trucks that you could be fed? Or do you see compromise, indulgence, convenience holding sway, and, and a misuse of life? Well, what Monsanto wants you to see when you look in the mirror is nothing. They want it to be dark. They don't want you to have the capacity to reflect on who you are, who we are becoming through the food we eat, the way we produce it, the way we give it to each other, what we know about it, and what we stand for. I do stand for something. I stand for a healthy earth. I stand for clean air and clean water. I stand for fertile soil and a sustainable food system. I stand for farm workers being treated with the respect and the decency they deserve, not because we generously grant it to them, I see us all in solidarity, committed to a healthier world and a healthier way of life, and therefore a healthier future for our children and theirs. I stand for this even at a time when the environment is deteriorating rapidly under the impact of human activities, when there are, is so much wrong. And, and I'm sometimes asked, how can you be as hopeful or positive or uh, as you are? And I am, sometimes. But I have a history of, 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 of meeting challenges and finding a resilience in us to work from to do that. And I want to tell you one of them was when I was a young Boy, I was born, as many of you probably know, into the Baskin Robbins family. My dad and my uncle founded the company, owned the company. My uncle died of a heart attack when he was 54, Bert Baskin. He was a very big man who ate a lot of ice cream. And, and when, when he died, I asked my dad, do you think there could be a connection? And my father said, no, his ticker just got tired and stopped working. 
John Bradshaw, the psychologist, talked about no talk rules in families, taboo subjects, the elephant in the living room that isn't mentioned, can't be, can't be mentioned because of whatever the, the needs, the denial mechanisms are. In my family, it was that there could be any connection between ice cream and heart disease, frankly, between diet and health, between sugar and anything. Um, but everyone in my family was, was fat and sick, and we didn't talk about it. We just ate ice cream. I ate a ton of it. <laughs> I ate ice cream for breakfast. I did. I swam in an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in our backyard. I invented Jamocha almond fudge. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Well, don't eat it on my account, please. Um, so you see, I have the karma. Look, I have to do this work, you see, because... <laughs> um, and, 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 and my dad trained me. He groomed me to succeed him. And I'm an only son, so the whole weight of his, his expectations were on me. And I loved it for a while. I mean, I did invent flavors, and, I, and, I, and I, it was a very successful company, and it was fun. Most kids love ice cream. I was no exception. Um, but then my own values began to emerge, and I felt pulled in a very different direction and um, chose to walk away from the company and, and not accept my father's desires. And, um, and then to be in integrity with that, uh, I made a further decision and choice and told him I didn't want a trust fund, I didn't want an inheritance, I didn't want to depend on his achievements. I didn't want any access whatsoever to his fortune. Because I wanted to live by my own uh, values, find them, discover my powers, and, and have that authenticity. And yes, it cost me a lot of financial security, but you know it made me more emotionally secure because I wasn't trying to please him anymore. I wasn't trying to think about well, how would that affect him if I thought that or said that or did that. I could listen instead to my own inner guidance, the higher power within me, the, the, the sense I, I, I was given of life's possibilities and opportunities and how, what part I could best play in them, in my relationships with other people and in the greater world. And I, I could answer then directly to you, to who we really are and to what's possible for us then, now, and still. And um, it's been a journey. My father was very angry. Uh, he'd worked his whole life. Uh, he'd achieved a level of financial success most people could only dream about. He wanted to share that. He wanted to give that to his only son. I'm sure, from his point of view, he, he got the only kid in the country that would turn that down. He wasn't manufacturing plutonium triggers for nuclear weapons. He was making ice cream. We make people happy, he said. That was the slogan, the advertising slogan. I said, no, we don't. We sell ice cream. It provides momentary pleasure. <laughs> I said, we say, human happiness is too profound a thing, I said, to trivialize like that. We don't make people happy. You can't make anybody else happy anyway. You, you know, people have to make themselves. It's an inside job. And he said, what are you, a philosopher? It's an advertising slogan. We make people happy. I said, no, we don't. He said, well, stop it. The point is to sell ice cream. I said, exactly. That's what we do. We sell ice cream. And he said, oh, stop it. <laughs> we were not on the same page. And, and so I left and, and led a very different life and um, wrote books. Uh, Diet for an America was my first. And it, it was published 25 years ago, in 1987. And in um, 1988, it, it hadn't yet become, it was becoming well-known, but it hadn't yet become that well-known yet. And my story, Rebel Without a Cone story, hadn't become that big a deal yet. And, and, and my father had by this time become very ill. He had diabetes that had progressed to the point of, uh, he, was, he, he was looking at the amputation of a foot even a leg, maybe. He was, his blood pressure was terrible. He took 10 horse pills every day for it, had, had severe side effects. He was very overweight. Cholesterol was out of control. Lots of drugs for all these things. And he went to his cardiologist, who said to him, Mr. Robbins, at this point, you're a very sick man. 
And the best we can do for you right now is to try to juggle your medications and try to make your few remaining years a little more comfortable. Uh, however, if you were desirous and willing of, to make really major changes in the way you live, there might be a different prognosis. And my father said, well, what do you mean? What kind of changes? And the cardiologist reached behind him and got a book and said, I think you should read this book. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and my, you know, he already had a copy. It was, my, it was Diet for a New America. And, and he, I had sent him an autographed copy. <laughs> but he didn't read it. But now he was given a copy by the high priest of Western medicine. And so he, did, he, did, he didn't tell him it was his son, by the way. He didn't tell him he already had a copy, and the doctor didn't know there was a relationship between the John Robbins who'd written it, and his, it hadn't become known that much, and, and my dad didn't tell him, and he just went home and started to read the book. And I'm sure it was the copy the doctor gave him, not the one I'd signed, but <laughs> he, he did, and he began to make changes, and he got results, and he made more changes, he got more results, and the reason I'm telling you this is that he lived another 18 years, most of which were very, very healthy. His blood pressure dropped so be normalized. He needed no, none of the medications he'd been told he'd have to take for the rest of his life. His diabetes went into complete remission. He didn't need insulin or diabetic shots. <clears throat> there was no amputation. His kidneys were saved. There, there, everything started to work. He lost the needed weight. And if my father can change, you know, <laughs> there's hope for anybody because he, he, you know, it's true, he, he got a lot of rewards. Wealthy people do, they get a lot of rewards for what they've done to become wealthy. And so they tend to re get reinforced in that very much. And so he was the ice cream guy. He stopped eating ice cream, he stopped eating sugar, stopped eating meat. He said to me, well, I'm not a card-carrying vegetarian. It sounded like it was something McCarthy was doing. <laughs> but, you know, I felt really good because I was able to give him something that I think was even more important, really, than had I followed in his footsteps and done the obvious thing and, and, and met his expectations. And he, he gave me something, too. Um, he, he called me up one day and said, Johnny, it's unbelievable. I can't, I can't really understand this. I said, what, Dad? He said, it, it's amazing. It's just incredible. It, it, he'd been to a Dean Ornish event, and, and, and I, said, I said, well, what is it, Dad? He said, I, I, it's unbelievable, Johnny. It turns out you were right. <laughs> <laughs> now, for him to tell me, the maverick son that rejected his life work, basically, that I might have been right, to me, I admire that about him more than I do all of his business achievements, really, because it's of the heart. And it shows that we can change. We can move our lives in a healthier direction. And he did that despite being Mr. Ice Cream. And I see a lot of times people making changes, and we want them to look a certain way and look a different way. But the important thing is the movement's going in the right direction. And so when I see the opportunity to pass 37, I'm very excited. I'm excited for all of us. This could be a wedge into Monsanto's plans to control the world's food supply. You know, in this election coming November 6th, some of us are voting uh, in the mail, but the, the election is on the 6th. The, in the presidential election, there are swing states, Ohio, Florida, I'm sure you know about this. And tremendous amounts of dollars are pouring into those states right now to try to get the votes of the few left undecided people. I always wonder who's undecided at this point. But there are some, and, and they're trying to get that. And California is not considered a swing state. It is assumed that we will go to Obama in the presidential election. So in that sense, your vote as a Californian uh, for, for, for the presidency probably isn't going to ma matter to the electoral college. I still think you should vote, by the way, for, in that and make your, 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 the numbers known. 
But my p- point is that in, when it comes to genetically engineered food and our right to know what is in our food, California is the swing state. As 37 goes, the rest of the country will go. Earlier this year, Vermont and Connecticut, two states, both came within a whisper of passing legislation requiring labeling of GMOs in their states. In both cases, though, the the legislation was curtailed at the last minute, once by the governor, once by a head of the Senate. And in both cases, though, because Monsanto Monsanto threatened to sue the state, and the legislator, the governor, did not want to encumber the citizens of those small states with the financial obligation to fight Monsanto in court. Monsanto's big enough and thug enough to bully states, intimidate them, and they drop the legislation. They can't do that to California. We're too big, and we have the the, the ballot initiative, and we're going to pass it. And, we, and, and, and there's, I wanted to mention one other thing. I think it's another point of uh, intervention into what's going on. And that's information, to inform yourself and, and read past the headlines. I saw a headline a couple days ago. The headline said, multivitamins linked, I think it was in the Washington Post, but it might have been USA Today, multivitamins linked to cancer. Now, I, I, I thought when I saw that, well, there must have been some study that showed that people who are taking multivitamins have a higher cancer risk. I wouldn't, that surprised me. I didn't expect that, but okay, I, I wanted to read. I read further. What the actual study found was that people taking multivitamins had a modest benefit. They had an 8% lower cancer rate. Well, I guess that's a link. <laughs> but the word link to me implies a negative that was the headline. Now, here's another instance. A study was done uh, at Stanford, uh, a meta-analysis of organic and conventional food, analyzing the nutritional benefits, or lack thereof, of organic foods. And it found that, for the most part, organic food, according to these, the studies that were being studied, did not have higher rates of vitamins than the, 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 the conventionally grown foods. They did say, find that the, the organic foods had, had significantly lower pesticide residues, that the organic uh, meats had way lower rates of antibiotic-resistant bacteria in them, um, but at a, at a vitamin level, they were equal. So they came out with headlines that said, Stanford Organic Study, which is a misnomer, it was just a small group at Stanford, but st- with the imprimatur of Stanford, Stanford Organic Study proves money spent organic food is wasted. Now, you probably saw this. It was all over the media. And, okay, so the vitamin levels were equal. The pesticide levels are very not equal. But let's say you had two glasses of water, and you were going to get to drink from one or the other. You get to choose. One of them is pure water. The other is pure water with some pesticides added. <laughs> the vitamin levels are equal. Totally equal. We've done studies, meta-studies, no vitamins in either one. Water. Would you consider those equally healthy and safe? No. How many people who eat organic food, who buy, who pay extra for, who seek it out, do so because it's the pesticide residues that they don't want to expose their bodies to, their children to? Their... Yes. That's the real reason. And there's also environmental reasons. And it particularly galled me that this study came out of the School of Medicine or was supported by the Department of Medicine at Stanford because anyone practicing medicine today has to know that the, the, the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria is an enormous problem for the practice of medicine today and increasingly in the future. It's serious. There, there, there were 100,000 approximately deaths in the United States last year from uh, people who acquired bacterial infections while in the hospital for something else 
And these were bacterial infections that formerly could have been cured by antibiotics, but the pathogens have developed resistance, so the antibiotics are no longer effective, so these people died. The numbers increase every year. And most of the antibiotic resistance is traceable to the vast amount, 80% of the antibiotics used in the United States are used as feed additives in factory farms so we can have cheap meat, cheap, cruel meat, cheap meat from animals raised in, in, in unbelievably unhygienic, filthy conditions, miserable creatures, miser miserable conditions, but you give them antibiotics as a feed additive, not as a medicine for a sick animal as a growth promoter, mixed into every meal the animal eats its entire life. You couldn't design, if you were trying to design a system to breed antibiotic-resistant bacteria, you couldn't develop a better way to do it. And we we're doing it. So for the School of Medicine at Stanford to, to, to be involved with a study that does find that organic meats have much lower rates of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and then not factor that into the equation and actually say, well, the vitamins are equal, therefore they're equally healthy and safe. To me, that's a lack of focus. These people may be ex excellent statistic statisticians, but I don't know if they understand much about food and health. And the predicament we're in today as a society and as a people and as individuals dealing with this planetary predicament. One of the acupuncture points I want to tell you is to, when you eat lower on the food chain, when you get more of your nutrients directly from plants rather than from animals who ate the plants, you're doing something very powerful for your health and the environment, and the creatures as well, the animals. And one of the studies that the UN did, the FAO at the UN, found that the uh, livestock sector uh, produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the transportation sector by a large factor. Other studies have shown that the amounts are even greater. World Watch Institute published a study a few years ago um, that showed that upwards of 50% of all the greenhouse gas emissions, anthropogenic ones, in the world are, are the result of activities in the livestock sector. This is beef production, this is poultry production, this is dairy production. And so those of us who are concerned about global warming might not have been thrilled when we watched the debates and didn't hear it mentioned, but we still know it's important, and it may be incredibly important to the future of life on Earth, to the survival of species, to the well-being of the, the, the life support systems we depend on for our very existence. And so we look to find that entry point into change, into positive change, and by eating lower on the food chain and getting away from factory farming and getting away from that cruelty and that environmental devastation, it turns out we're doing something healthier for our bodies as well. We we're become leaner, trimmer, healthier, happier people for the most part. And it doesn't mean you just have to be a vegetarian and all your problems are solved. It doesn't mean you just by eating organic you're solved. It doesn't mean we just have to pass 37. No, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is difficult. We are going to be challenged. We are being challenged. Confronted. How we respond will determine who we become, whether we survive, and I would say, frankly, whether we deserve to. Because if we take down other species, if we harm other peoples and other creatures without concern, if we're so focused in a small way that we don't see the bigger picture, if we limit ourselves and restrict our awareness and succumb to, this, to, to the, the war on awareness 
and allow our, 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 our consciousness to be contracted to the point that we can't care anymore. We can't live in terms of the greater good anymore. We can't feel history making itself known in us, working its way through our personal lives, through our political lives, through our actions, creating the world we dreamt of when we came here in the first place and still dream of if we dare. It's easy to be resigned, it's easy to be cynical, it's easy to be acquiescent today, to go into compassion fatigue, to say there's too many problems, they're too big, the momentum behind them's too great. And to forget that inside each of us and inside you, there's a force demanding expression, needing to live, that cares and cares beautifully, cares utterly, cares so much it will hurt, but it won't stop you. Because the hurt is just part of the growth by which we become worthy of this challenge. And the strength that we need, we can find together, we can find in our hearts and in our lives and in our choices and in our discussions with one another about what really matters. And those discussions need to be informed. We need to be aware of what is taking place to the animals so the ag-gag laws don't stop us from seeing and knowing what's happening. With our, with, with our food, how it's produced. So we don't believe it when they say, oh, there's a link between multi and cancer and trying to pl- imply that, that vitamins are giving people cancer when the opposite is the case. So we don't fall prey to the headlines that say, Stanford Organic Study says organic food's a waste of money. No, it's not a waste of money if you care about pesticides and farm workers. It's not a waste of money if you care about pesticide residues in your bloodstream. There have been studies recently that found that children who had greater pesticide residues in their urine had higher rates of attention deficit disorder and higher rates of autism. Um, We've had many studies showing that connection between pesticides and birth defects, pesticides and cancer. Well, the people that did the Stanford, what's called the Stanford Organic Study said, well, the residues that we found in the conventionally grown foods were within allowable limits. Well, those limits are set at the EPA under tremendous political pressure from the agrochemical lobby, from Monsanto. They don't represent any kind of indication that I feel safe trusting, and I'd like to see the the people who did that faced with those two glasses of water and we'd say well but the the pesticides in the one are within acceptable limits but that means it's a safe cleaning up our world from chemical pollution cleaning up our minds from the pollutions of repression and, 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 and control freeing our hearts and our thinking so that we are who we are, who we've always been, alive. It's a precious opportunity. And, and I, I really thank you for your commitment and conviction and, and the choices that you've made to swim upstream. You know, the culture is flowing one way, telling you, shut up and eat what you're told. Don't ask too many questions. And some of us won't. And we want the thrill of working with each other, knowing we're part of something that's greater than ourselves and that means well to all of life, that takes into account every living being, now and in the future. This, to me, is pro-life. 
This to me is pro-choice. And I'm not talking about abortion at the moment. You know what I'm saying. We have the opportunity to, cho opportunity to choose what gives us life. To choose to affirm what gives us life. To choose to support it, to honor it. It's a privilege. And it's a privilege for me to be a spokesperson for it, to have your attention for this time. I thank you for that. I thank you for being here. I thank you for caring. I thank you for listening. Most of all, I thank you for acting. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.